Okay, so good morning, everybody. I just wanted to welcome you to the inaugural SESO or SESO or STEM Equity Seminars for Owls talk. Um, I'm, you know, co-hosting the event along with Sophia Kim, the director of the Science Learning Institute. So we just wanted to welcome you all, just give you a little bit of a rundown of what this series is all about, and then introduce today's speaker, Dr. Heather Fulling. So this um, series was basically born out of the idea that, you know, there's an equity problem, to put it mildly, in the STEM disciplines. And this goes across the board, right? It's not a chemistry problem, it's not a physics problem, it's not a math problem. Some disciplines maybe have more of a problem, but I think that's, you know, those are relative terms. You know, so what is, you know, so what are some strategies that we can employ to sort of combat this issue? And well, one of them is education and, or two of them are education and exposure. So we thought that a seminar series like this would be very beneficial to both our faculty and our students, and, and of course our staff as well. The idea being that if we can hear different scientists' stories, and how they sort of their trajectory in their chosen disciplines. And if we can learn a little bit about what their discipline, what work in their discipline actually entails, then we might basically have some more tools in order to sort of combat this, um, this problem. Or at the very minimum, a student in particular might feel a little bit more confident or a little bit more aware as they approach you know, their, their transfer or even further education or their career beyond that. It's something that I've personally struggled with in my chosen discipline, um, which is not to say that I, I have it better or worse than anybody else, but I think it's something that a lot of us probably here at Foothill can, can definitely uh, understand. So I think it's really important that we start to sort of address these issues and at least talk about them in the, ser in the format of a, a seminar series. Okay. Um, let me see if I have anything else here. Yeah. Oh, the other thing that I, I always like to end on the note that, you know, the, the war has certainly not been won, but I, I do like to point out that things are significantly better than they were years ago. And I think that's just worth acknowledging. And it's through these types of efforts, right? These, these small events and these small changes that add up to really big changes over time. So with that, um, I just wanted to welcome our speaker today, Dr. Heather Fowling. She's going to give the first talk of this uh, series. We're very grateful to her to um, for you know volunteering her time to give us um, you know to give us her story right and her her opinions on these issues. I also wanted to thank Jeff Matthews for recommending that Dr. Felling give a seminar with us today. Um, he had mentioned to me that they are that they know each other pretty well, and I just found out about 15 minutes ago that they play Mario Kart together all the time. So they're they're friends, you know. So he put it he put it lightly when he said it to me, and I, I thought that was super cute and entertaining. So I'm sharing it with all of you. Um, but anyway, so um, so Dr. Felling is a physicist by training. Um, and or, or has a holds a PhD in physics, which my understanding is that most uh, practitioners of astronomy are physics PhDs or have a, a background in physics. Is that is that right or not necessarily? It's not necessarily. I would say, I best maybe about thirty percent do. I think okay. the rest are astronomers. Okay, get, All right. the PhD in astronomy. Okay. Um, so yeah, so she has a PhD from the University of Michigan in physics. And she has done two postdocs, which I give you a lot of credit for. I, I barely made it through one, so that's that's awesome. Um, emphasis and her, you know, emphasis on streamlining data collection from telescopes and sort of organizing the data of telescopes and a lot more stuff that, uh, to be frank, I don't, I don't think I can paraphrase well. Maybe she will explain to us a little bit more, a little bit what her work is like, and and what she does. Um, but it seems what I gathered from her biography is that myriad skills are necessary for the type of work that she does. And I think it'll be interesting. We all tell our students this, right? There's, you need to know the science, but there's a lot of other things that come along with that as well. Um, she's also a very strong advocate for equity and inclusion in astronomy and in STEM. And I believe she's going to talk to us a little bit about her work in that area today as well. 
Okay, so before we get started, I just wanted to give a little bit of um, some ground rules here. So we are recording this seminar, so you will have access to it later, or if you wanted to share with anybody that couldn't be here today. We're going to ask that you use the chat judiciously to, so as to not detract from the speaker. And we will have a Q&A. There's time scheduled for a Q&A at the end of the talk. So if you have any questions, you can let them, you, know, you can put them in the chat or you can hold them until the end of the talk. So, um, you know, that's pretty much it. And Sophia, did you wanna add, add anything before we get started? Nope, I'm all good, thanks. Okay, all right. And thank you to all of you for being here. We're, we're really, really excited. I hope you enjoy the day. And with that, um, Dr. Felling, you can go ahead and get started. Okay, I will share my screen. Give me a minute. Okay, can everyone see that? Yep. Okay, all right. So um, I, I came up with a cheesy title, Pixel Pipelines and Surfing Telescope Data. And for a couple of reasons. One is because I live and work in Hawaii, except right now I'm in Texas. Um, and there's a really famous surf spot in Hawaii called the pipeline. And what I work on is called a data pipeline. That's how we get the data from the raw pixels to something usable for the scientists. So I kind of liked that and felt I should have pipeline in my title and have it be the surfing one. And then the surfing telescope data. Well, I, I normally would just call it mining, but surfing works too. Um, one warning I have is that I'm currently at my parents' house. So hopefully there won't be any interruptions. They know I'm giving a talk, um, but it might, I might get interrupted and it'll either be my dad or the, the two dogs. So you've been warned. Um, it'll probably be brief if it happens. And yeah, this is really great to be here. And thank you very much, uh, for Jeff, for talking me into this and you guys don't have to call me Dr. Heather Flewelling. You can just call me Heather or Dr. Heather if you want. So the outline of my talk, it's roughly chronological order. So I'll talk a little bit about uh, my philosophy on life, my journey to becoming a scientist, the PanStars database and fun things I've done with variable stars, my work with astronomy allies and other things related to that. My second postdoc, which was as a planetary defense researcher, uh, the summer of 2020, where I was unemployed during the pandemic, and then my current position as an instrument scientist at Canada France Hawaii Telescope. So this talk is kind of messy, and I think that's mostly because right now my life is kind of messy, and this is not at all the same talk I would give if you guys had asked me to give this uh, before the pandemic. Things have changed, things are different now, and I don't know, I, I feel it's important to talk about them. So my philosophy on being a scientist. So I am not one to plan out my career. I did not even know what grad school was until I was a junior in college. You know, those kids in high school and middle school who are like, I'm gonna be a doctor, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do all these steps. I had no clue what I wanted to be in middle school or high school, no clue at all. And that's totally okay. You don't have to have your life perfectly planned out in order to, to do what you wanna do. And my philosophy has always been just keep doing things as long as they are fun. And I've had a lot of fun so far in astronomy, which is why I've, I've stayed in astronomy. It's uh, very competitive. It's, you know, the odds are not in your favor of becoming like a tenured faculty somewhere, but as long as I can keep doing research I like and get paid enough to do what I wanna do, that's fine with me. And another important thing about being a scientist is I don't ever step into uh, research thinking, okay, I'm going to discover this one type of thing or whatever. I just keep my eyes open and I look for interesting stuff because a lot of times the new science, the interesting stuff comes from when you notice something, you're like, huh, that seems kind of funny. What's going on there? It's, it's always those weird things like that. That's where the science is at. You don't just say, I'm going to discover this new type of matter. That's not what happens. You, you just have to keep your eyes open and just pay attention to when something seems a little bit odd. And that's, that's how I chase my science. And I have a philosophy also on equity in STEM, which is if I see something I don't like, I try to fix it. And all of my activism so far has been motivated by problems I've experienced or I've watched my friends experience. And basically I want to 
change the field to make it more inclusive. And I'm going to try anything. Some things work, others don't, but hey, at least I try. I feel better just trying. I'm not, I'm not content to just sit and see problems and not try something. And I do this because I don't really feel like I completely fit in as a scientist in this, in astronomy. And I feel like uh, I want to, I want to make the field more inclusive and I want to feel like I fit in. And I'm totally fine with, with trying whatever I can to do that. And I will warn people, this does hurt my career. So there are times where I've spent more time thinking about how to improve the culture, the workplace culture, and less time on my science. And that does hurt. And I'm okay with that. That's a choice I made. And I do also have a reputation of, of being like one of the one of the problems. So in, in some sense, like some places where I've worked, they know that I'm going to be the one who calls them out when they have like a list, a short list of faculty candidates after looking through 200 and not a single one is a female. I will call them out on that. So they know that and that's okay. I'm, I'm fine with that. I'd rather, like I said, rather have a more inclusive, diverse uh, workplace. And so I'm a little bit noisy. <laughs> so that's how I operate. So I, I figured I would tell you guys a little bit about what my day looks like as an astronomer. So first of all, I am on a computer all day long and it's not even a, a really fancy computer. Right now I have a laptop. It's a, like a 13 inch, just generic Lenovo laptop. And I don't even have like an external monitor or anything fancy like that. It's just a dull, boring laptop, but I use it to connect to the, the fancy computers that we have at my workplace. Like we have a cluster of computers. So I use this little guy here that I'm using Zoom for as my portal into all the cool big computers. And I do a lot of programming all day long in C and Bash, Perl, MySQL, whatever, whatever I, I need to use to get the job done. And it's primarily either improving the, the data pipeline or writing scripts to help me. And sometimes I do hardware things. So uh, I, I sometimes build sensors connected to Arduinos, and then I have to write the software to interface the Arduino to the computer. It's still a lot of programming. And uh, the other thing that's a big component of my job for all of my jobs I've had is sometimes I'm on call. So sometimes you have to pay attention and make sure that the telescope stays alive and you'll get text messages and then try to debug what's going on. And usually that happens like a couple of times a month for a week or so. Uh, and I know this all sounds like not at all what you're expecting an astronomer to sound like, but this suits me. This is what I like. And the cool thing is I can look at raw images fresh from the telescopes. And I have to say, like, as a kid growing up, I was always interested in computers and programming and stuff like that. So that I ended up finding a way to be an astronomer where I spend a lot of the time on a computer, that's probably not that surprising. Like that's definitely something that was an interest for me. And not all astronomers look like me. A lot of other astronomers do do other things that are not so intensive and always on a computer. So, that, but that's just how it works for me. Others will build instruments and others will just think and try to come up with theories explaining the observations. But I'm, I'm not really one of either of those types of astronomers. I really like playing around on a computer and that's what I do. So I found this meme on the internet, <laughs> just of an astronomer. So what my friends think I do, what my parents think I do, we don't actually use telescopes like this, uh, except for outreach. And then what you find out is if you ever ask me to do outreach and show people where things are in the sky, I'm really bad at it. Like, I know how to do the things like on a computer. I know how to search for things on a computer. I have almost no sense of where things are in the sky. I can usually point out the planets and that's it. If you ask me which planet, hopefully I pick the right one, but no guarantees. It's not something I do all the time. And worse, even if I go and visit the big telescopes that I use, you don't look through eyepieces. They have cameras mounted on the backs of them and you control them remotely with a computer. And usually the, the computer operations are somewhere else, not at the summit. They're like in another town, like lower elevation. So yeah, I never ever look through telescopes except for outreach. And I guess what society thinks I do is I look like a nerd and I act like a nerd. I, that's pretty accurate actually. And I am definitely no Carl Sagan. Uh, so media's got that wrong on me. And, and do I think I, I do cool things fighting Death Stars? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. 
I find all kinds of stars, but none of them are a Death Star. And then what I actually do is pounding away on the keyboard, making my monitor explode. That's, that's actually what I do. So this is my journey so far. Um, I went to high school in Texas, uh, in Austin, and I was one of those very weird, very smart kids, just did not fit in. And I graduated early. I also failed classes. I failed history, actually. I got told I wasn't college material. But on the other hand, in other classes, I was like really good in math. Like this must have made my mom nuts because <laughs> she would get these glowing reports from some of the teachers that I was the best student in the class. And then the other teachers were like, she's failing. Why is she failing? So I think I, I, I did poor things to my mom. I feel bad about that. Anyways, I graduated high school early and I went to University of Texas in Austin, which is the university in my, where I grew up. And I started off undeclared, no idea what I wanted to do the first two years. Um, I liked math. I took a computer programming class. I liked physics. I liked chemistry. Eventually, basically at the last possible moment, I declared my major as physics. And I didn't know what I was going to do with a physics degree at all. I, I just thought, hey, physics is hard and challenging and I like it. And that's why I chose physics. And it wasn't until later on in uh, my undergraduate degree that I got exposed to research. I went and did a research experience for undergrads, and that was really great for me. Um, I got, you know, I got to try doing research. I liked it, but also uh, RU experiences tend to uh, favor, like, they want minorities and they want women to get exposed to research. And so that was, I guess, my first time really meeting with and talking to other female scientists. So that was, that was good for me. And so after that, that was also the first time I encountered a grad student and a postdoc. I was like, wow, you can do this in physics. You can stay in school and they'll pay you. I thought that was cool. So that was basically why I decided to go to grad school was I could continue going to school and they would pay me. I thought that was cool. But again, I had no idea what I wanted to do for my research. So I picked University of Michigan. It seems safe. It's a big department, a lot of different uh, areas of research. And I'm like, I don't know what I'm gonna do, but I'm sure they'll have something. And so my first year there, um, the, the faculty that I ended up uh, working with, he talked about gamma ray bursts. And these were very mysterious, very unknown objects that they were finding in, all over the sky. They didn't know much about them. And on top of that, he was building a camera that was getting installed in Hawaii. So I was like, that sounds really cool. Travel to Hawaii and learn about mysterious objects. So that was exactly how I picked my project. I, I don't know, that's how I did it. So I, I did that. I got my PhD in physics and uh, mostly smooth sailing. It was, it was long, it took me eight years. So it's a little longer than average, but I don't know. I just, I wasn't really on fire to, to finish quickly and figure out what I was doing with myself. So then it was time for me to find a job. I don't recommend this. I only applied for three postdoc positions. I didn't even finish filling out the third one. Uh, two of them were in Hawaii. One of them was part-time in Hawaii. And uh, yeah, I basically had it in my mind that Hawaii was the place I absolutely wanted to live. And I chose my postdoc positions based on that. And that's really limiting. And even then I was thinking, well, if I can't find a position in Hawaii, I'll just find a different job. I won't be an astronomer. So I lucked out and I found uh, a position in PanStars. And that's a, a large survey telescope and they needed a data pipeline. And after that postdoc, then I did a postdoc uh, in Atlas, which is in the same institute, also a telescope with a really cool job title, planetary defense researcher. It's basically, I found new near earth objects, new asteroids, that's it. That's how I was defending the earth. And then uh, in the middle of all this, um, last year happened and I'm calling that my intermission year. And so I ended up being unemployed in the middle of a pandemic with other problems going on. So my dad got really sick. So just my whole life was very messy, just falling apart middle of last year. And then I had, you know, no job. And then eventually found this instrument scientist position that I'm currently at. So that's been my journey so far. So it's, it's I don't know what to say. It's um, a little messy, but it works for me. 
So I'll talk a little bit about pipelines because I keep mentioning pipelines. So this has been the common theme throughout all of my positions and my research. Um, I'm kind of an odd astronomer. Most astronomers, they fixate on like their one chosen subfield. So they'll, they'll work on exoplanets their entire career. I'm not one of those. I have jumped around. So I started off working on gamma ray bursts. And then when I was in pan stars, I worked on variable stars. And then when I was in Atlas, I worked on asteroids. And I haven't quite yet started things at Canada, France, Hawaii. I'm probably doing a combination of things with comets and also with variable stars. But normally people just focus on one chosen subfield. I instead focused on the data pipeline, which is what do you do when you get the raw data from the telescope? So it's a little complicated. Um, you get raw images from, from these very precise instruments. And it's not like a picture from your camera. It kind of is, but not quite. So there's all sorts of, of, of issues you need to correct for. So for example, um, with the camera, if you just close the shutter on the camera and take an exposure for some length of time, I guess maybe naively you might think you would see nothing. You would just see black. But that's not what happens. The electronics in the camera make some noise and that shows up as an image. So even though there's no light getting to the camera, you take a picture when there's the shutter's closed, you get something. So that's something that we can subtract off of the raw images to correct. That's called darks. And then the other thing is that, like if you take a picture and you can do this with your own camera yourself, if you take a picture of like a wall, like a, a uniformly illuminated wall, if you take a picture with your camera, you will notice that uh, it's not uniformly the same color on your image. You'll find the corners are perhaps a little dimmer and the, the, the middle is brighter. That's, we, we do that in astronomy, that's called a flat, and you can correct for that. This happens with the telescope optics, you get uh, parts of the image that, are, that appear brighter than others. So what I do with a data pipeline is get the raw images from the camera, I correct it for the darks and for the flats, and then I will find all of the locations of all of the objects in the image and the, calculate the brightness. So it doesn't matter, I don't care if it's a star, a galaxy, a piece of dust or whatever. If there's something that's bright on the image, we'll figure out where it's located and how bright it is. So up here, let's see the mouse, yeah. This is a raw image from Megacam. And you can see the different levels, are, they're just different. That's, that's how it comes straight from the camera. But then once we have cleaned it up, um, it looks nice and uniform and you can even see stars in here. So that's, that's what I do is I, I take raw images that look really messy and I clean them up and I get them ready for the scientists to do the things. And yeah, once we find the, the locations of the stars, the other thing that we do is there's a number of sky catalogs that have, um, that have the positions of the stars in celestial coordinate systems. And so we start off with, we know where the positions of the stars are like in X and Y coordinates uh, on the image. And then we figure out how to map them onto the sky. And then once we're there, the, we know like certain stars, they have a certain brightness, they don't ever change. And from that, we can calibrate the images here so that we know how bright our stars are uh, mapped to the catalog. This is important because a lot of times what astronomers do is we're interested in stars that are changing their brightness or new objects that suddenly appear or are moving across the field. And so once we've matched it to the catalogs, we can see what's new and different. So it's very important to do this. And other things that I do with the pipeline, uh, in addition to like helping write it and maintain it, you have to track every single step of the processing um, on a given night. So ROTC, which was my grad school stuff, Pan Stars and Atlas, they take about a thousand images a night. That's a lot of data, especially with Pan Stars because each exposure is a 1.4 gigapixel exposure. That's a lot of data. So you have to make sure, you have to track and make sure every single exposure is taken care of. And you get everything all lined up and ready for the other scientists. So I don't really do a whole lot of science with this stuff. I facilitate and make it possible for other scientists to do things. And other important things I do with the pipeline is I fix bugs and I just, I keep the machines running. So uh, usually um, 
especially with PanStars and Atlas, like it takes clusters of computers to, to do this. With PanStars, with the large images, they had about 300 computers used to process all the data. And so it's kind of a huge computer science project to keep all of this stuff going. So I'll give a little introduction of PanStars. This is the thing that I've spent the most time uh, in my career. So PanStars is a telescope in Haleakala, Hawaii. It's in Maui. It's a 1.8 meter telescope. So uh, like about six feet across roughly. Field of view is three degrees diameter. Now, um, to put this in terms, I think you guys will understand, the moon is 30 arc seconds across. So it's basically the field of view is like six moons across. So this is huge. Normal, uh, mo most telescopes that are not like this one, uh, the big telescopes usually have a very small field of view. So it'll be like a fraction of a moon. That's what you see. And this one, you can basically see six moons by six moons. It's huge. And the other thing is we have five different filters for this telescope and filters basically basically just let you see different colors of light. So you can see mostly blue light, mostly red light, mostly yellow light, things like that. And why astronomers do that is if you have color information like that on the stars, you can figure out like their temperatures and things like that. So there's different information you can get with just having different filters. And PanStars, I don't have a slide of this, but it's, it's pretty cool. It has 60 chips for its camera. It is, uh, the, the camera itself is like the size of a large pizza. It's huge. And what they did with this telescope is they did a survey. So the survey was to map out all of the sky that could be seen in those five filters, uh, all the sky that was available in Hawaii. And that was basically three quarters of the sky. I think that's generally true pretty much wherever you are. If you have a telescope, on Earth, you're not going to see all of the sky. If this telescope was in the sky, if it was like the Hubble telescope, it could see everything. But we can't see things very far south for pan stars. We're just too far north for that. But for the survey, they covered three quarters of the sky over the course of four years, uh, roughly hitting each spot of the sky 60 times. This is um, this is really cool. Other telescopes, if they can cover a lot of sky, they're not as deep. They don't see as many faint objects. And then, so this is like groundbreaking. Not other tel no other telescopes have done this. And then you might have heard of things like Gaia. Gaia is a telescope in the sky that covers all of the sky. It only has two filters, not as not as faint. And then also for comparison, Hubble, um, it it has a very small field of view. It does not cover all of the sky. I mean, it, you can see all parts of the sky, but it doesn't cover it in a survey way, but it's much fainter. Um, and this picture here in the background, this is actually someone stitched together all of our exposures for the survey to show what we saw. So this is the Milky Way as observed from our PanStars telescope. It's probably about 200,000 exposures were stitched together to build this. So a little bit more about PanStars, uh, the data release. This is a huge thing. Uh, this happened a few years ago, and it's only right now the three quarters of the sky that we observed. And basically everything from the single exposures, and then we also stack up those exposures to get stacks to go deeper. And this database is the largest astronomy database for a telescope out there. It has 6 billion different objects and it's available for anyone to use. You guys can go right now, if you wanted to, to either of these three web links, and you could try and see uh, any part of the sky that PanStars could see. It's available for everyone. This is really great. This is a huge amount of data. This allows grad students and other people to mine it to look for things. You don't need telescope data like traditional astronomers do. You can just mine things. And this is, this is great. This is really great for grad students and, and postdocs. So my part in creating the database, uh, first of all, I worked on the image processing pipeline with a few others. This was initially processing the data to be ready to be used for this. And then 
I built massive databases with everything in this. This, this is, this was spread across about 60 computers, uh, lots of terabytes of data to get this working properly. I was primarily the one who designed the database schema. So I was the one making choices as to what data people could look for and get out of the database, as well as transforming all of this stuff into the batches that we loaded to the space telescope machines like us. So the same people who run Hubble have a cluster of computers and they're the ones who are housing our data. And this got chopped into 25 million batches that I had to uh, manage. And each one of those batches would often have millions and millions of objects in it. This is a lot of data. This is big data. And I was also responsible with a few others with data verification and debugging. Actually, the science that I got out of Panstars, I, I was I kind of stumbled across it as a way of uh, verifying the data. And this took years, uh, all of this stuff. It took years, one to two years to reprocess all of the data in a consistent manner. It took a year to make the batches. It took two years to load at the space telescope. All told, I was in Panstars for nine years. And um, the final iteration of the database was completed a year after I left. So it, it took 10 years from when it, they first had light to when the data got out into the database. It's, it was just a huge effort. So one of the things that I did was variable stars. That was my way of verifying the data. And uh, it's a survey telescope. And I, I mentioned they covered all of the sky. Well, they also had 10 fields that were very special that they would just keep visiting every night if they could. They called these medium deep fields for reasons I don't understand. Um, basically, though, they tried to observe two to three of these different fields every night in two to three different filters with eight exposures per filter. What this means is you end up with about 4,000 different exposures for each of these fields over like the course of three and a half years. And they were using these fields specifically to look for supernova and discover new supernova. Once they found the supernova, they were like done with the fields. They're like, okay, we've got what we wanted out of it. But it was this great set of data for me to mine and find new things in. So previously for other uh, survey telescopes, what they do is, uh, first of all, no other telescopes except for probably Kepler and TESS, uh, they did not have like, thousands of points of data, they would have like 50 to 100. And so what they would do is they would select candidate stars based on a combination of what color the stars were, because they know, oh, if a star is this color, it's more likely to be a variable star. And then also they would see if uh, the, the brightness of the star was varying by some, some metrics. So they would select those out, and then they would do further analysis or observations to figure out what was going on with the star. I did something completely different. Since I had access to a huge cluster, I was like, I will just check every star in these fields. And so I did. And that's like two and a half million stars in all of these fields that I checked. And basically, uh, you can do a like something like a Fourier transform to see uh, if there's a periodic signature. And that is usually that usually indicates it's a it's a variable star. And so I did that for all of these candidates, and then I filtered out and found uh, variable stars. So this was kind of a different way of approaching this. It, it didn't have the same biases that the previous ways had. But I primarily use this as a way to test and verify the PanStars database. So I have a few examples. Um, so here's an RR Lyrae star. The plot on the left, you can see different colors. Uh, those different colors correspond to the different filters that we used. And this is just uh, the, the x axis is just days. So um, astronomers count things in terms of mean Julian days, but basically, uh, it just increments up. So this is with time and this is with brightness. So up here is very bright, down here is not as bright. And then this just goes forward with time and it looks kind of messy. It's just just it looks like a lot of scatter. However, variable stars oftentimes will vary in a very predictable manner. They'll have like um, 
a phase and a period to how they're varying. And so if you can figure out the phase and the period, then if you plot like on this right one, the phase on the bottom and um, the brightness, you can actually see this is the same data. Uh, if you get the period right, you can see that actually, no, it starts bright and it gets fainter and then it gets bright again and it gets fainter. That's the same data as from the left, but just if you can figure out what its period is, then you can fold it and then you can see how it's varying. So I did this for two and a half million objects because computers are fun and I can do this. And I, the only filtering I did was each object had to have more than 200 detections. That's just to make sure I had enough points to work with. From this, uh, I had 10,000 candidates that I thought might be variables. And I looked at all of them and hundreds of clearly variable stars and about half of them are new and unknown. No one's ever seen them before. And so I have a few examples here and you can see they look all kind of a little bit different. Uh, the one on the right here looks kind of like the one on the previous slide. This one just looks kind of wavy and weird colors. Um, this one, these guys don't vary as much as, as this one does. Um, this one I like to just call the wave. There's a whole bunch of them that just look like waves. So this is uh, an example of six of them. And then I have a page of like all of them, <laughs> not all of them, but most of them. Uh, so you can see a wide variety in what variable stars look like. And a lot of these would have been missed using the traditional ways of, of finding variable stars. So yeah, this is, this is some of the fun things that I've done with a very large set of, of data because no one else was looking, no one thought of this. So now we'll switch gears a little bit and talk about astronomy allies. So this is a thing that me and Katie created, and I created it while I was working in PanStars. And I created it because um, while I was in PanStars, we would go to this conference once a year. And I kept being harassed by this one individual and it did not make me comfortable. I tried reporting this to my home institute and they're like, that's offsite, not our problem. I tried reporting this to the conference and they really weren't sure what to do. No one had ever reported things like this before. They didn't really have a procedure in place. The best they could come up with was to tell him to stay away from me and then to tell me that they couldn't do anything more because it might hurt his career. However, this person kept following me around and bothering me and it was intimidating. I really felt intimidated. I did not feel safe. And it felt like it was hurting my career instead. So um, I felt safer when I was just, you know, with one of my friends. If I wasn't by myself, I, I would feel okay. And so basically Katie and I started the support group I needed, which was literally just for me to text her and her to hang out with me or have another friend hang out with me. And what we found is that I wasn't the only one who, who wanted this, who needed this. There were other people who were also having problems, didn't even know they could report things and also just were not feeling comfortable at conferences. So we started Astronomy Allies. It was just entirely a grassroots effort with just anyone could contact us if they needed help. We had a phone number, we had a Twitter account. Um, we offered safe walks home, which I know that sounds kind of strange, but at conferences, a lot of times you do networking in the evenings, you go out to dinner, you're in a strange town. It's dark, it's unfamiliar, it's downtown. And I don't necessarily feel comfortable going to those things, knowing I'll have to walk back to the hotel by myself. So we offered safe walks home and this works out really great. This actually, people thanked us for this because it was so obvious, but it was something that really opened up networking, you know, after hours to a lot of people. They're like, well, I don't feel like I can't do that. I can just ask someone to help get me back to my hotel. This is great. And we enjoy doing this. So we were doing this and offering mentoring and support, just letting other scientists know, you know, what they were experiencing, you know, it's not okay and we can try to help them. And this really took off in ways I did not expect. Um, first of all, because of this, uh, conferences now have very prominent anti-harassment policies, and I helped uh, give them some suggestions and ideas of what to put in those. I've seen other fields copy us, so not just astronomy, 
uh, I think geophysics was the first to copy us, and I've seen other fields copy us as well. Uh, and the, the field is much different at big conferences. It used to be, um, you would see, you know, the grad students, the female grad students, and they would be very timidly standing by their poster. And then you would, you could actually watch guys come up to them and just start hitting on them. And you just see them just kind of close up and just not feeling comfortable. And I don't see that anymore. Like I see a lot of, more, a lot more confidence and I like this. And I see actually, it feels maybe because I'm older now, but I, it feels like the astronomy conferences have also shifted to younger as well as I see a lot more undergraduates presenting their work now, which I think is great. Like, cause it used to be when I went to my first one, <laughs> I was a grad student. And the thing that struck me was it was just a lot of really tall, old balding guys. <laughs> so I didn't see hardly any women. And I was like, this is weird. So I like I like the feel now. It's a lot, it's a lot more inclusive and a lot more diverse. So I just have a couple of uh, just screenshots of various articles. Like I said, we were not expecting this. This was literally started off as a, let's make Heather feel safe at conferences. And this got picked up by Nature, by um, Physics Today, by various other news outlets, CNN. Um, also, I got to give a talk at the National Academy of Sciences on sexual harassment. That was pretty cool. Um, so yeah, it just got picked up by everyone and, and it helped improve uh, the culture, I think, for being at a conference. So one of the things that happened because of that was because of my activism, um, the Committee for the Status of Women in Astronomy asked if, if I would like to be a committee member. And this is part of the American Astronomical Society. And I said yes. And I was one of the younger ones who was in the committee. And I, I highly recommend if someone offers you to be in a committee for a national organization, you say yes. And the reason why is the networking, because whenever I go to any conference, people know me for this. They don't know what I've done with PanStars, even though it is a database a lot of astronomers use every day. No one knows that. But they know what I've done for American Astronomical Society for Women in Science. They thank me for doing the newsletter and they know of me that way. And that's good, actually. I think that's that's gotten me a lot more uh, out there because I'm, I'm in Hawaii. It's hard to go to conferences. My favorite part of this is I'm the lead newsletter editor. This is a really fun job. So if I find like newspaper articles about women in science, I will put them in the newsletter. We have information about mentoring and other things like that that goes in the newsletter. Uh, and then people will submit jobs like you know, they want to make their workplace more diverse and they'll submit jobs and those go in the newsletter. So this is this is great fun. And we have a lot of resources. So the first link I have is just for the Committee for the Status of Women in Astronomy, which has a whole page of, of resources. They have a very active blog, women in astronomy blogspot.com. It has articles once or twice a week written by some of our committee members, as well as the newsletter gets posted there. And there's another other couple of of blogs that I like to read. Um, astronomy and Color focuses on, you know, in, improving diversity in astronomy and women in planetary science also. A lot of women in planetary science and they, they have blog posts about that. So those are some of my favorite resources that either I work on or I've encountered in this position uh, in the Committee for the Status of Women in Astronomy. And all of this is entirely because me and Katie started Astronomy Allies. No one would have known anything about me if, if it wasn't for that. So I'll shift gears again. Um, I switched over to Atlas. So the reason why was after building the big PanStars database, I was done. <laughs> I needed to do something else. I had spent nine years there and I just, I needed a change. And Atlas was a group that was, um, you know, in the same building as PanStars. So they knew I would, they, they could tell I needed a change. And so they basically, kind of asked, would you like to work on our group? And I was like, yes. And so then uh, it was a hidden opportunity that they didn't really formally say they needed a new postdoc, but they did create one for me to apply to once they were sure I wanted to apply. And Atlas is a little different than PanStars. It has two robotic telescopes, they're half meters. So this is one of the telescopes here. And um, the, the two telescopes are located in Hawaii. So one is on Haleakala on Maui. 
and the other one is on Mauna Loa on Big Island. And what they do is they have a small camera. So if Panstars was the size of a large pizza, Atlas is about the size of a cookie. That's how big its, its camera is. Um, I did many of the same things. I worked on the pipeline and I started searching for new asteroids. That's what they were doing. Each one of those telescopes can cover about a quarter of the visible sky. And each one of them uh, hits each point of the sky four times a night. And so you can see here, you can see the little purple ring around the, the asteroid. You can see it zipping across the, the image. So we have software pipelines to detect these things. And that's what we did. And here's a map of the asteroids that were discovered whenever I, I made this plot last, I guess, a couple of years ago. And yeah, these are the small asteroids. They're new and you can find them anywhere in the sky. There's no preference. And this bottom picture here is just the sky coverage. That's just showing how much of the sky we cover in a couple of days. So that's what I was working on there with the really cool title of planetary defense researcher, which is big fancy words for I find new asteroids. And I was also helping build sensors for this telescope because it is a robotic telescope. We don't have people on site. So the coolest thing that came out of this was I discovered a comet. And it's kind of funny. Everyone in our group has discovered a comet. And when you discover a comet, you can get it named after yourself. And for whatever reason, this made huge waves with my friends. So I'm a ham radio operator. And this was just the coolest thing to all my friends. They're like, wow, you discovered a comet. And so they kept talking about it and they kept writing blog posts about it. And it ended up being on the local news and it ended up being in multiple uh, ham radio magazines. Like, I don't know how or why this is the thing that's making me famous, but it is. And that was just really cool. So the, the, the one thing that I think I'm known the most for is the thing that was just the most routine part of my job of, oh, look, a new comet. <laughs> I'm looking for an asteroid. Um, so that was that was the coolest thing I did in Atlas uh, by far. But it was cool. And I think this is one of those things like I try to explain to my parents what I do with the database and it, their eyes glaze over. It's boring. Comet, they're like, wow, Comet, you discovered something in the sky. That is really cool. I've done this with variable stars. They're not interested. It has to be a comet. I don't know why. So all of that was was fine and good until last summer and last summer was awful. So this is the pandemic times. Um, I ended up quitting my job in Atlas and for a lot of reasons. Um, I liked what I was doing there. I did not like the workplace culture. It just wasn't a good fit for me. It wasn't a good fit for them either. And I'm gonna say things are really bad when you quit your job in the middle of a pandemic, in the middle of a lockdown. I had no plans of what to do. I had no job lined up. I just, I couldn't, my life was falling apart. I just couldn't work there at the same time as my life was falling apart. So I quit. And I was cut off from colleagues and friends at work. Mostly, I think, because of the pandemic, because no one knew I had left. There, you know, you normally you see people, you wander around the halls and you're like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm leaving. I'll, I'll see you around. None of that. Like, I was just cut off. And my email got cut off and my computer access got cut off. So that was, I wasn't expecting the email or the computer access to get cut off like it did. So it was isolating. Uh, so by myself in the middle of a pandemic and lockdown, because when I quit Honolulu, you weren't allowed to leave your house except for essential business. And it was, I could go grocery shopping and I could walk my dog if I had a dog and I could go to work and that was it. There was nothing else you could do. And I don't know, I'm the kind of person who likes to walk off whatever things going on in my head. And I couldn't, I was just stuck. I was just stuck in a very small apartment, just thinking about things. And it was hard. I watched as close friends and family got sick, uh, some with COVID, other had other illnesses. I watched close friends die. It was, it was a rough year or a rough summer. And it was really interesting to watch some of my scientist friends, they managed just fine. It was, they're working from home. Astronomy is a lot on the computer. So there wasn't much difference. They're just doing it from home instead. And then others just really struggled. 
and for different reasons than what I was struggling with, like, especially my friends with kids, because uh, childcare was no longer a thing. So they were taking care of their kids at home and also trying to juggle um, their job at the same time. It was just really hard for a lot of people. And you've seen this actually, uh, there's studies done where women have published fewer papers last year than men. And it's, I'm sure this is part of one of the reasons is women have to do childcare and stuff like that. So yeah, pandemic is, is hard for a lot of people. And then also I was trying to find a job, but there were so many hiring freezes. The university I was working at had a hiring fuse, freeze, many other places as well. So there's less jobs to apply for. And being on the newsletter editor thing, you know, I, I kind of keep an eye on what jobs are out there. And it was just like, it was nothing. The summer was just rough. There's nothing available. It's like people were waiting for the pandemic to end before they figure out if they have funding, if they can hire someone. And then on top of that, you know, I was seeing some of my friends getting promoted and I was like, wow, this is really rough. Like some people were succeeding in this and then others were not. And I was just in the middle of it unemployed and then watching my dad from afar, just struggling. Cause he, that's when we found out he had cancer. And so I, I was just, my whole life was a mess. So yeah, I, I spent a lot of time thinking, well, what's really important to me? And I am real, I'm still thinking about this. It's, it's not easy. Um, and part of it, it was, I worked so hard in Pan Stars and Atlas and I wouldn't take vacations and I didn't see my family often enough. And then this pandemic happens. And then now I'm just like, wow, I don't know that I want to keep doing that. And yeah, it was, it was hard. And I, you know, I did quit my job off into the unknown with no plan at all. Like I said, I don't plan things, but would I do this again? Yes. Yes, I would. Um, I think I should have actually changed things up sooner. Um, I was always afraid of what happens if I'm unemployed. <laughs> it's not that bad. I mean, yeah, there's no money coming in, but it's also kind of nice to have a break. And I hadn't had a break like that since grad school. So yeah, I learned a lot of things about myself in the summer and yeah, it was hard. I, I wasn't sure if I was going to stay in astronomy because I couldn't find jobs. So I was actively looking for things in data science and other sorts of things, freelance jobs I could do because I'm pretty good at programming. I, I just was struggling. So my I have a new modified philosophy on my life, which is work life balance is now important to me. Um, <laughs> I won't work a job that prevents me from paying attention to other important things, specifically my family. This is really hard and very important when you live in Hawaii. Uh, there were years I did not go home and I live in Hawaii and my family can't afford to visit me. And I, there's years I missed not seeing my sister's kids and not seeing my dad. And I don't get those years back. So now that's important to me. I've decided that's more important to me than working hard and trying to, you know, get some permanent, faculty job. That's not going to happen. I, it's more important for me to worry about my family. And the other thing is I won't shrink myself down anymore. Um, at some point, especially at my last workplace, I, I was kind of hiding myself. I was hiding. I was smart. I was hiding my hobbies, hiding my activism, because usually when, when other people around me were finding out these things, they would give me some amount of grief for this. And I just didn't want it. Um, so I'm not going to compromise on this. I won't work at another workplace that doesn't let me be myself. If they're not okay with me being so active and trying to improve things for women in STEM, I don't want to work there. Like I've, I've made that choice. So this is, this is the, this is the YOLO version of Heather. You only live once and I'm not going <laughs> to, I'm not going to stick around and, and let things not be quite what I want. So ultimately, will I stay in astronomy? I don't know. I love astronomy, but certain aspects of workplace culture, I just don't like. And if I can find places that works for me, that's great. So yeah, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not committed to staying in astronomy if I can't change things, I guess. But luckily I did find a job. So this is why networking is important. I got a job at Canada, France, Hawaii telescope. This is not a job that was listed. This was they had lost a couple of astronomers because of the pandemic, actually. So they were due to get new astronomers coming in from France. Their old astronomers had left. The new astronomers couldn't come in because of all the travel restrictions and visa restrictions because of the pandemic. So they were short several astronomers and they were hurting. And so they knew my background. They knew 
what I was good at. They knew I was in Hawaii and they basically offered me a job. It's not a normal job. It's a temporary contract job because again, hiring freezes, like they, they found a way of working around the hiring freeze by offering me a contract job. So that happened for me uh, in September. So a little bit about Canada, France, Hawaii telescope. Uh, it gets funding from Canada, France and Hawaii. And so if you're in Canada, you can use this telescope. If you're in France, you can use this telescope. And if you're at the University of Hawaii, you can apply for time for this telescope. And it's huge. It's 3.6 meters. Um, so PanStars was the previously large telescope I'd worked for, and that was like 1.7 or something like that. So this is quite large compared to PanStars. And it's on the summit of Mauna Kea, again, another telescope in Hawaii. Um, and it's been operational for like 43 years. And it has five different instruments. And specifically, the instrument that I use is Megacam. So here we have a picture of Megacam. And it has 40 CCDs. And like with my other food related comparisons, it's like the size of a small pizza. <laughs> and here it is um, installed on top of the telescope. Um, right here is where Megacam is. And then the mirrors down here. And my job is I'm the Megacam instrument scientist. So I make sure the data gets processed. So here's Here's an image that I just found. Um, it's a pretty wide field of view. It's it's about a degree across. So PanStars was three. So this one is smaller, but still very large for a large telescope. And I also help with uh, the, the cues. So they have observers which stay up all night who manage the cues and make sure that observations get taken. I'm the one that helps with the schedules sometimes. So they have divvied it up between the astronomers and so several days a month, I help with making cues for the telescope so the observers know where to point. And this is a very large, very, very productive camera. This telescope or this instrument has been in use since 2003. So it's 18 years old, but it has a lot of data and it's all archived. Uh, there's a location in Canada where they copy all the data to. So that's a lot of data for me to mine. So I will definitely dig into this. Uh, I just finally got a computer, like a, a good computer to process the data with. Um, so I'll start mining that data for, for variable stars. So that's my new job. It's really cool. Um, it's very inclusive workplace. I have never worked with other female astronomers and everyone in our group, except for one guy, they're all women. It's really cool. I've never experienced that before. It's, it's just really nice to do that. One of the things I've also done is I've made a tool to create color astronomy images. So if you're in Jeff's class, you might have seen this. Um, basically, I have here a set of different points of the sky you can look at, all observed with Megacam in different filters. And then you can assign the different filters to the red, green, and blue channels that you normally would use to make a color image. And you can adjust the sliders um, to change what the image looks like. And you can zoom and pan around. So this is a very simplified version of how astronomers make color images, because this is something I get asked a lot for outreach is how do astronomers make their, their color images. So I made a little tool so that people can play around and try this out. And it's available online. You just need a, a web browser to use it right here. So that's a, another important thing I like to do is I like to do outreach, which I like talking to other people about what I do. It's a lot of fun. So I think that's about it. Uh, things I have learned, which would like to share with you guys is it really doesn't take much to create huge changes. Like astronomy allies literally started off with my friend, letting me texture and then meeting up with me. So I would feel safe. And then because of that, we created astronomy allies, which then got copied with other places and it's made conferences feel a lot better. But it was just one tiny little thing that we did. And I, I was just astounded when we did this. I never would have expected that. And then the other thing is you don't get to pick the things you get known for. So everyone always, when they first Google me, they're like, oh, you found a comet. A lot of people also know the astronomy allies, but almost no one knows about the PanStars database, which it's the flip of what I would think. Like PanStars database took nine years of my life. That's the thing I'm most proud of. 
astronomy allies, I'm also proud of that, but you know, the database, I want to be known for my science and astronomy allies is not science. And then the comment that was, I've discovered multiple comments. One of them has my name on it and I'm like, well, okay. Like that's the thing everyone gets excited about though. And the other really important thing is networking is super important. None of these jobs with the exception of PanStars would have happened without um, networking. Like people knew who I was, they knew my reputation, they knew what I was good at and they wanted me and they made jobs for me. And that's super important. I cannot stress that enough. Like you see job listings and um, there's probably as many jobs that are hidden as there are that you can actually see that, to apply for. So that's super important for finding what you do next. So yeah, that's um, everything about me and my activism and my science and my career. I guess I'll stop sharing. Okay. Uh, great. That was fantastic. Thank you so much. I thoroughly enjoyed that. Um, I don't know. I don't, I, yeah, it just, the, the science was cool. It's not stuff that I personally hear about every day. Uh, your personal story really resonated with me. I, I think, I think probably with, with many women, um, so I got a little teary eyed, you know, for momentarily, and then I, I recovered. But um, yeah, I just so just thank you so much. That was that was really great. Um, I do. We are a little bit over time, but I do want to uh, see if anybody has any questions. I definitely have some, but we can also talk about those a little bit later in the afternoon. Um, I actually had a question. I wasn't sure if, oh, hi, Professor, it's Maria from hi, Kempton. Maria. Hi. Um, I wasn't sure um, if I, obviously, you know, like, like Miss Heather was saying how the whole comic thing, the comic thing is usually what gets people. Um, since you found yours, Heather, like, since you were able to find a comment, are you able to actually track it yourself? Like, do you know if it comes back around? Or was it like a one-time thing for your comment? Yeah, so it's a... It will come back around, but not in our lifetimes, not in our grandchildren's lifetimes. Like it's it's one of those long period comments, like thousands of year kind of comment. It, it's not coming around for a while, but you can actually look it up. Um, and there's a lot of websites where you can put in uh, comment names, and they will they will track them for you and tell you where in the sky they are, even if you can't see them because they're too faint. Wow, that's awesome. And then um, if you don't mind having, I, I wrote down a bunch of questions, but um, so in terms of you were talking about um, how I think you were talking about like outreach and like looking for stars and stuff like that. And you, how you said that you put um, raw images, uh, you, you pretty much decipher, I guess, the raw images and clear it up and give it to scientists. Um, and you had also mentioned how the these scientists do the the actual I think the celestial coordinates you were saying well I so, do the, the coordinates but oh, uh, they, you, do okay, the okay. Things, they do the things with with the with the data in those images okay, I just get so, it ready for them oh okay so I have to ask because I was always told obviously in high school you know sometimes like stars die and you know eventually in billions of years so I mean are you also in charge of updating that um, coordinate like let's say there was a star at one coordinate and then it dies off in like hypothetically five years like, do you have to go back and, and re-change re it? Nope. So what they do is basically it's a timeline. You can find information about a star for, you know, and it's important to know, oh, it existed for now. And then you can see when it, when it died. So it's, it's nice. Like oh, okay. I was always curious. That's pretty cool. Okay. Thank you so much again. Thanks. All right. It looks like some people have dropped off, but I just want to make sure if there's any other questions. Um, I know, Heather, you said you weren't going to be looking at the chat, but you're getting a lot of um, appreciation, a lot of people saying thanks. And I think your story really resonated with, with yeah. a lot of people. I, I did look at the chat after um, okay. my talk. I just can't, I can't do two things at once. I can't, yeah, no, I, can't I can't talk. Yeah, I can't I even can't. pay attention to the clock, apparently. Right. Um, all right. Yeah. I guess if there's not any other questions, um, we do have a break scheduled for you now. 
And then you're meeting with Jeff, right? So I don't know if you want to take a little bit of shorter break or push Jeff back or what you want to do, but it's up to you to, to decide. Oh, I'm fine. I'm fine. I, I am prepared. I have a cheese stick here. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. So why don't we just do like a 20 minute break and then at 1230 California time, 130 your time, I think, right? Um, you, you can come back to this zoom and then we will, um, proceed with the afternoon. How does that sound? Okay. Yeah. My, my clock on my, uh, my clock still says nine. So it's oh, I'm still in Hawaii right. time for some reason. Yeah. Okay. Well at, at 30 minutes past minutes. the hour, we'll leave it okay. at that. Okay. Okay. All right. I'm just going to mute and stop my video. Sure. Oh, actually, can I intercede, say something real quick? So, you know, I think, you know, Heather, when you said that a lot of astronomers are using pan stars, right? You know, I think that you might be, even that is underselling it, right? There's basically not a piece of research being, you know, it's, it's hard to find research being done in astronomy now that is not using pan stars, right? It's but just being used for everything. But they don't reference me. They, they just <sighs> mention it's from the space telescope website and if you go to their website then they say go reference heather but <laughs> uh, <laughs> happened enough but yeah I, I don't know i don't know how how much people use it i, I haven't looked too much but i yeah I, you're probably right i'm probably underselling it uh, yeah because it, it's it's been a while since i've seen a paper that that wasn't using it okay well, cool yeah, i think maybe underselling it then I'm glad you clarified oh, that. Wait, un underselling? Wait, yes, underselling. You're underselling it. Yeah, yeah. Well, did, did I yeah, say? That's... No, you said it, I think, right? Oh, no, okay. that's sorry. You're, I'm glad that you're explaining how widely used this actually is, is what I'm saying. So yeah, that's yeah. another thing that that women in particular tend to do is they tend to undersell themselves. Mm -hmm. So there you have an example of it. Yep. OK. All right. I'm also going to go radio silent here, I guess. And then we'll, yeah, we'll reconvene at um, 30 minutes past the hour. And thank you, everybody, for attending today's seminar. Thank you so much, Dr. Blilling. Thank you.